Thanks a lot. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. And whenever it comes to sp uh, speaking about ML and AI, uh, it is always very exciting. Uh, so machine learning and artificial intelligence in the past has always been in the shadows of universities and uh, research institutes. In the future, particularly in the next decade, uh, it is going to be seen in all the consumer products that we kind of are going to live with. And product managers like me and you, we are going to play a critical role in, bring, in bringing uh, this vision uh, to life. So today, uh, I'm here to speak about the role that product managers play in machine learning products and what we will be playing uh, in the future. Uh, I did a similar talk uh, in the Santa Clara Center, uh, and what made it really engaging was people asking questions. So this is hopefully very interactive, and I please feel free to stop me, uh, ask questions, drop insights whenever uh, you can add uh, to the conversation as well. Awesome. So what will we do today? So we will begin with a very like rough uh, refresher of what machine learning is about. Uh, particularly, we'll talk about things which are relevant in the rest of the uh, talk. Then we will speak about the landscape of machine learning products uh, and how it has changed over the past uh, two decades and what, is, what it means for the future. Then we will talk about how machine learning products are built, like all the steps involved, and the focus of the talk, which is the role that product managers play uh, in, this, in this new world. If uh, we have time, uh, we will have an open interactive section about, section about how do we prepare for machine learning PM roles uh, for those who are looking to interview into that. Just to set some expectations, uh, so I will gloss over some Uber-related problems and use cases, but I will not dive too deeply into that. Um, and again, this is not a lecture. Uh, this is my experience, my perspective, and I want it to be highly interactive. Also, machine learning is a vast field, uh, so this cannot be exhaustive. Uh, these are just some examples here and there to kind of motivate uh, how people solve different sort of problems. Uh, also, I assume uh, that most of you here are not machine learning experts, uh, and I've tailored this talk to people who are probably not machine learning engineers, those who are not uh, machine learning PMs, but those who want to. So let me test my assumptions before we start the day. So start start the evening. Uh, how many of you are actually machine learning engineers? Good. Please feel free to correct me once in a while. Uh, but 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 glad to know. How many of you are uh, product managers on machine learning? Okay, cool. Also say, say the same thing. Uh, and in general, uh, engineers here. Good. Uh, PMs. Awesome. Uh, startup founders. Cool. And the rest of you, which fields do you come from? UX. UX. Awesome. Cool. Sounds good. So please feel free to stop me if some things are not clear. Ask me if, if I see that things are uh, super obvious, and I might try to accelerate uh, it as well. Let me introduce myself. By the way, my name is uh, Dev Dutta Gangal. Uh, I studied computer science at IIT Bombay. Uh, for those of you who do not know, it is one of the uh, very good school, engineering schools uh, in India. Then I joined Capital One. Um, Capital One is built on machine learning. So there are a couple of things that they do. First thing is figuring out if they send you a marketing brochure for a new credit card, what is the response rate uh, that they can predict uh, for you to actually accept and sign up for a card. And then once you sign up for a card, they also predict uh, the risk rate, which is the probability of you actually defaulting and charging off. The company was founded about 20 years ago, but was machine learning is the core uh, of that company. I then moved on to Yahoo, uh, where I was manager for product insights for Yahoo Mail and Yahoo Messenger. Uh, I helped a lot of the product marketing teams to make their targeting uh, much more efficient. Uh, and also figuring out the value of uh, a lot of the messenger uh, users in, in the messenger graph. I then moved on to Zynga uh, and Tinyco, where I was managing revenues for some of their large games. Then I spent uh, three years at Groupon. Uh, I was managing mobile apps, iOS, uh, Android, uh, the location platform, as well as the notification platform. I was also on the relevance team. And there we use machine learning to basically rank the deal so that once you open up the Groupon app, uh, you get the best deal that is suitable for you. And also you get the best notification once per day that is tailor-made uh, and personalized for you. 
Currently, I'm at Uber. Uh, I am on the Maps team, the Sensing Inference Research team. Quick refresher on machine learning, and again, this is going to be super simplistic, uh, and I, I'm going to throw some very introductory concepts just because I'm, I will use them later on uh, in, the, in the talk as well. For some of you, it might be repetitive, but just please uh, bear with me. Uh, what is machine learning? Machine learning is nothing but finding patterns uh, in data. Right, so I'm just, just going to use some terms. Uh, so you have a training set, which is a set of labeled data where you know what the input is as well as the observed uh, output. Then you use machine learning algorithms uh, to train on that data and then you form a formula or an equation like H of X, which takes an input X and then it predicts uh, the output Y, right? That basically is machine learning. This, uh, this image is taken from Professor Andrew Wing's uh, course. I am also going to now speak about three different types of machine learning techniques um, and just to kind of represent the three generations of how machine learning techniques have evolved, uh, how they have improved, uh, and how they have become more and more powerful. Let me first start with uh, linear regression um, or even linear classification. So there are large sets of problems which are uh, which, where the data is what we call as linearly separable. So let me explain what that means with an example. So the example here is you have a lot of data and what you're predicting, uh, data for homes, you, in this simplistic case, you have data around, let's say the average price per square foot uh, in that given location, the square footage of that home, and let's say the number of rooms in that home. You have this data and now you have to predict what is the price uh, of that home. So so just predicting the price is called as regression. Uh, classifying and saying that, hey, either whether it is about $10 million or lower than $10 million is called as classification. So in this particular case, you can actually form a linear formula to kind of determine the price. Or you can have a plane that kind of separates the entire 3D space uh, into, into two buckets, where one, all homes below $10 million, all homes about $10 million. Uh, this is also a very starter example that most professors use uh, in, in, what, in the first or the second lecture. Uh, this is certainly a product that, uh, product that is uh, out, in, out in the market, like Redfin and Zillow and all these companies certainly predict, uh, certainly use a lot of data, not uh, way more than three uh, input variables, but a lot of variables to actually predict uh, the value of the home. Yes. Absolutely, yes. So in this case, there are like three dimensions here, right? Uh, so linear model is basically x, y, z, and if you, if you can figure out a model as a form of x and y and z, that, that's a linear model. Just to kind of uh, icebreaker here, uh, any guesses for whose home that is? Not, has got nothing to do with machine learning, but just. <laughs> okay, the address is 2101 Waverly Street, Palo Alto. I wish it was mine. I also wish I was that person, but unfortunately not. No. Um, so this this is Steve Jobs' home, and oh, I, I love that home in terms of architecture, etc. So that's why I just kind of to wake up the audience, I uh, put this example in. Um, but yeah, so Redfin and Zillow certainly use um, certainly use linear regression or, or maybe some complex model to determine the to estimate uh, the value of any given home. Now let us move on to the next, let's say, generation of uh, machine learning uh, problems or even techniques. In many of the cases, uh, your data is not actually linearly separable. So let me start with a very simple example. In this case, uh, there are you need to separate the green dots from all the red dots. Uh, so basically, all these green dots are, let's say, green dots within a particular circle. Uh, you cannot actually represent that circle in any linear format, right? Uh, this is, of course, a very simple example, but there are lots of examples where you cannot draw, a, you cannot, you cannot cut cut the hyperplane, in, sorry, cut the hyperspace into with a hyperplane, or you cannot have a linear formula. So, what engineers and what machine learning scientists have done is they created uh, a new technique called as feature engineering. What they do basically is in this, but is in this very simple case, they will create a new feature. In this case, it will be like x minus one square plus y minus one square, right? And what that will do is that will basically create a, create a hyperspace with much more dimensions, 
but in that hyperspace you can actually have a plane that will separate the green points from the red points as an example any questions so far or can i can i move forward yeah so as you're taking us through these models do you consider these to be within the field of machine learning then or because again they're allowing you to issue a prediction based on the data that you present to the model uh, absolutely uh, yes yeah, so machine learning i mean so certainly artificial intelligence and deep neural nets are of course a part of machine learning uh, but i would say even a simple linear regression is machine learning one one right uh, and most professors will actually start from linear uh, i mean linear models then they will move on to techniques like let's say svms for example where some feature engineering or some tricks are required to take your data add more variables or add more dimensions and then the and then then the then the problem space becomes linearly separable so this is this so a lot of the products that are actually uh, out in the world like web search for example uh, or even ad uh, ad ad optimization etc use tricks like svms um, they also use uh, what we call as decision trees uh, which are also of course non linear where it it the logic kind of for follows a tree like uh, model right before we move to deep learning uh, i just want to stress one point here which is in in any of this non linear models what is heavily required by your engineers to do is feature engineering right so really understanding the data that with which they are playing is critical uh, and then of course doing feature engineering and sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but doing that iterative process it's it's very costly uh, for for anyone to get there yeah so for feature engineering features for feature engineering are you looking at weighting other components and being able to apply it to the data set that you're looking at yes so that is yeah that is precisely what to do and so it is a combination of again picking up what variables right so in any real data you have hundreds of variables <coughs> figuring out what of which of them are important how do you how do you use variables in kind of conjunction with, with each other is critical so in let's say the second generation of ml problems your engineers spent a lot of time doing feature engineering right uh, that, that that's the point that i want to convey but now we have moved to another technique uh, which is called as deep learning right uh, let me explain what deep learning is before talking about the advantages and disadvantages what deep learning does is basically it stacks a lot of linear models behind each other right to solve a lot of complex problems like let's say is that a dog or is that a car you cannot just i mean feature engineering is, is going to be limited it is not scalable what deep learning does it's again as i said it is a sequence of a lot of linear models stacked behind each other and then there are these non linear connects which has proven to solve a lot of complicated problems like hey uh, image recognition for example now these techniques have worked uh, it is called as neural networks because it derived inspiration from what scientists think is the way our brain works now the advantages here again is no feature engineering is required we have come to a point where engineering architecture is enabling us to actually leverage something like this but the clear disadvantage certainly is that uh, deep neural networks are hungry for data until we have a lot of data they just do not work um, and I, this is my opinion by the way that i mean some people say that hey dnns are like they mimic the brain but i haven't actually seen or read any paper that conclusively says that our brain is a form of a uh, deep neural network so what i mean to say is that our brain might have some structure which is completely different than dnns but so far dnns have been able to do uh, or have been able to solve a lot of lot of problems uh, there, there is a there is a professor who who is now at stanford college fire fellow so she uh, she gives a good example of the limitations of dnn she says that her her daughter uh, is able to identify things using just a few examples right uh, and i also tested it out myself i i told my daughter just two times that hey this is a unicorn and this is a horse this is unicorn and this is a horse and like in the third try my daughter who is like 2 years of age by the way sorry i forgot to mention that but she was able to <laughs> so my 2 year old daughter with just two examples was able to identify what is a unicorn and what is a horse right i didn't explain to her that there is a what is a horn and stuff like that dnns will not be able to do that as of today so that is the limitations that dnns have so before moving forward just just a recap i mean 
these three kind of represent the generations of how machine learning has evolved uh, with the pros and cons. Any questions before I move on? Cool. Awesome. Uh, now, we, we spoke about a lot of having training data, but you always don't have data. So let me again throw in three terms. Uh, whenever you have data, whenever you have the training set to kind of build your models on, it is called as a supervised, uh, uh, supervised learning technique. There are instances where you do not have uh, labeled data. Uh, so for an example, in this case, let's say all of these are actually gray, but they, they are actually separated in some space, right? So then you can use techniques like clustering to say, these are actually, so these set of yellow points are actually different from these sort of blue points, and then you can actually color them as yellow, blue, uh, and green. There is a third technique called as semi-supervised learning, uh, in which what happens is you do get a lot of uh, data, uh, which is somewhat separable, uh, but you have some labeled data, uh, which you can use as seeds or to accelerate your learning. You can also employ human beings to just look at some sample sets and then say that, yes, this maybe looks like a, a fraudulent case. So this maybe looks like there is something funny happening here. And then all other data points close to that point, you can then start thinking of that as either fraudulent or non-fraudulent, for example. So for an example, for semi-supervised, you have YouTube looking for Correct, yes. Shall I move on? Awesome. Uh, now let me speak to the landscape of machine learning products and how things have evolved uh, over the last uh, three decades. Uh, I again kind of compartmentalize it into three. So first starting with uh, machine learning products which have been existing for the last couple of decades and which have, be, which have made businesses much more efficient. Uh, then over the last five years or so, we have seen a lot of products which deliver consumer uh, delight um, and also help assist consumers in some cases. Uh, and then we will talk about a future where it's like AI is going to take over the world. Uh, so let me start with uh, some of these examples. Uh, in many of these examples, starting with computational marketing, whether it is online ads or like product recommendations as, as I used to do at Groupon, uh, or whether it is credit risk, which is determining whether uh, someone is going to default or not, stuff like high frequency trading, or anything that has got to do with uh, fraud detection, whether it is uh, spam, or payments detection, or identity detection. Uh, machine learning, and particularly some of the early techniques of machine learning, have been in de production for the last two to three decades. Uh, but they, they are just not seen by everyone else, but they have been in the background for quite some time. Then we moved over to products where consumers started touching uh, machine learned products. So web search, for example, or automated voice, uh, uh, voice machines. Whenever you pick up a phone, someone kind of recognizes what you're saying and then determines whether it's like whatever, send, it, send your phone to one department or another. Um, over the last maybe two to five years, we have seen a lot of uh, products personally around, I mean, typically around personalized assistance. So Google Now is a good example, right? Google Now takes in a lot of inputs where I am, gives me a lot of hyper-local recommendations, uh, knows what is in my calendar, makes prediction whether that, whether that meeting is important to be shown to me at that point or not. A uh, lot of chat bots, uh, China, uh, WeChat in particular, uh, runs on a lot of uh, chats and a lot of people have deployed chat bots to kind of automatically talk to uh, human beings. Uh, same with a lot of image and face recognition. These days you can go to, let's say Facebook had this moments app or even Google photos. You can like search for, hey, I'm looking for photos for this person and it just shows you the entire list of uh, those photos. Uh, so these are, these are products which are in the consumer assist form which we have seen so far. Uh, and lastly, there are, there are, there is a lot of research happening in the medical device uh, or medical assist uh, area. Uh, I haven't particularly seen an example which is like productionized at scale, but there is a lot of promising work going on there, uh, plus in uh, agriculture. Yep. Um, when we're looking at consumer assistance and devices, what kind of proxies are we relying on to uh, affirm that the model is working properly or, or that it's not working? Because we're not just sending them a yes or a no, like, did this work? Mm -hmm. So, correct. So, we will, we will speak about like, say, accuracy of models uh, later on. Uh, but think about, let's say, personalized personal assistance. If, if let's say, they make a wrong prediction, uh, it is not going to hurt you as much. You are just going to say that, hey, this product 
does not work well yet, right? And you are going to just forget it. Uh, there are some instances like web search, etc., where if you get the wrong results, you are not even going to realize that you are getting the wrong results. Plus, there are some cases where, like, if you make some wrong predictions, it's actually going to cost uh, a lot. So we will speak about accuracy. Uh, I think personal assist and chatbots fall into a region where if they make mistakes right now, I think people are forgiving. And then in the future, again, uh, plenty of stuff, well, plenty of exciting stuff is happening. AI is actually going to take over the world, uh, whether it is self-driving cars, smart homes, or smart, or, or smart bodies, which includes wearables and the way you interact with uh, your surrounding. Uh, it is time. It is time for machine learning and AI to get out of the science fiction books and get out of universities and research labs, out into consumer products. Uh, there are four strong trends which are going to make it happen. Uh, starting firstly with commoditization of deep uh, learning architecture. What it means is fresh grads uh, led by a senior uh, machine learning person can actually leverage things like TensorFlow uh, on let's say and train on AWS to actually make a lot of magic happen, right? So, so, so that's one. Uh, secondly, uh, the chips are getting more and more powerful. Uh, the GPUs are becoming more powerful. Things are becoming smaller in nature. That just means uh, that whether it's your phone or whether it's the devices all around you, it's going to be easier for that distributed computing to happen uh, right at the source. And then there are other things which are going to enable the ecosystem, starting with uh, cheap and excellent sensors. Uh, the cameras on your phones are getting better. Um, I mean, everything around a like touch sensor, uh, IMU, GPS, etc., are improving and getting cheaper. Data plans uh, are uh, data plan rates are falling. Uh, India, for example, there is a plan that that gets you 10 GBs in just uh, a dollar. Um, and as you can expect, there is there will be a lot of talking that happens between your uh, end sensor or end uh, computing device and maybe the cloud. So cheap data plans are critical for us to uh, accelerate uh, any any kind of development. And then the last thing is, uh, particularly around if you if there are many things that you need to distribute out, uh, you need to take care of uh, battery and power. Um, there is enough uh, innovation happening in that field as well. So with all of these uh, like trends converging, uh, what uh, we are going to be in a similar state, uh, just like uh, the uh, the App Store and the Play Store were, were ten years ago, where uh, there were there were millions of teams all over the world of like five to ten undergrads and uh, pe people who with enough experience to solve localized problems. Uh, just the way like App Store and Play Store boomed, uh, I think artificial intelligence is going to have a very similar evolution. So it's not just going to be the top uh, top four four to ten uh, companies and maybe like hundred companies in the Silicon Valley but people all over the world who are going to access the power of artificial intelligence. Now, what does it mean for product managers? What it means for product managers is it is going to be your job to determine what problems to solve, right? Uh, so you have the technology, there are many problems in the world, figuring out what problems are key to be solved, figuring out whether they can be solved, all these decisions need to be taken uh, and these experiences need to come to life. PMs are going to play a critical role uh, in that uh, revolution. So with that, let's move on to how ML products are actually built. Uh, and as we go through the process, uh, we will talk about where do, where do PMs play uh, a role. So firstly, uh, building machine learned products uh, is a multi-step iterative process. Uh, there are lots of trade-offs to be made, so lots of decisions to be made. And also, I will talk about all the steps, and also there are multiple stakeholders. So certainly starting from your consumer, uh, then the government and regulators who are increasingly interested in AI, primarily because of data privacy and data ownership. Then of course your business stakeholders, whether it's you as a PM or your CEO, and then your data scientists and engineers uh, who are actually going to build the machine learning models and engineers who are going to scale it out. Uh, so you as a PM is certainly in the center of all of it and it's your job to kind of keep everyone connected. So communicating things, defining, defining the policy, defining how things work, defining what to work on, etc., is going to be a critical job that any PM plays. So now let's go over each and every of this step. Uh, or actually let me take a quick break for questions. Uh, any questions so far? multi-step model 
that you've got there, you don't cover uh, sort of um, transparency or uh, or whether there are any specific um, goals that you're looking to optimize for. So I think part of that was in the problem. So the next, so you're talking about this? Yep. Yes, so we will speak about, uh, I mean, so what I've covered is how do you communicate the decisions you have made to your consumers, um, and then government privacy is something which I have not particularly covered here, but we can, we can discuss it over Q&A. But it is very critical. Uh, governments are playing a larger role in defining what, again, again, internet privacy means, what data privacy means, who owns the data, who owns the trained data, uh, if you have a trained model, who owns it? So a lot of activity is happening in that area. So let's cover each of them, and uh, we, will, we, will, we will stop off for questions uh, as and when necessary. So the first thing that a PM needs to do is identify uh, what problems to solve, right? So now think of it. So scientists and universities uh, typically take a different approach. They're like, hey, a lot of data is available. I have this new source. How do I? how do I find something interesting, right? How do I build something more interesting to get like uh, more efficiency and whatever? Now, as a PM, your job is not to fall into that tap, trap or not to let your team fall into tra da uh, that trap, but ask basic questions, which is, what is the problem? Uh, is this problem big enough? If ML solves it, is it actually going to change the consumer experience and, and the business? Uh, and will I be able to measure the impact, right? So PM 101, but that uh, as a PM, you certainly need to uh, do that. The next step is then answering a question whether is machine learning actually required to solve this particular problem. Um, again, teams, particularly a lot of engineers, get tempted to throw machine learning at every single problem. Uh, but you as a PM, you need to ask some basic questions, which is, one, can some heuristic-based approaches solve, solve your problem, right? Uh, secondly, uh, why are you actually using machine learning? Can machine learning actually outperform human beings? So one example is credit risk. Uh, the smartest of human beings can look at someone's credit profile and probably not determine uh, whether this person is going to charge off or not, right? Can machines do a better job? And they have proven to have done a better job there. Um, the third thing is, is machine learning results explainable to the consumers? And I have a slide uh, where we can discuss uh, that. Uh, and then other thing is to understand, uh, I mean, where, where does machine learning add value? So in some cases, machine learning helps you understand what happened in the past, uh, but in some cases, machine learning helps you predict uh, the future. So figuring out where exactly is your machine learning solution uh, is very important. Uh, and then in, there are some cases where machine learning helps you make humans more efficient. So for example, if there is a security agency looking at like hundreds of homes where possibly bur burglary could be happening. Uh, you could use machine learning to kind of pick, pick some videos where burglary is actually happening or someone is entering, and then the human can make a decision, right? So understanding where does ML play a role uh, is very important. Also, these are, those, these are the things that you need to think about, uh, which is accuracy. Uh, I think someone asked a question, right? So if you, uh, if suppose you show someone a wrong uh, advertisement, uh, as long as it is not offensive, it is it is low cost. The the the, the so you can afford to be not that highly accurate. Uh, for all these new experiences around face recognition, etc., Google and Facebook, when they introduced it, could have afforded uh, to be not highly accurate. But imagine doing something similar in let's say medicine. Uh, you cannot afford to be not accurate. If you're do, drive, doing a self-driving car, you cannot, you, I mean, high accuracy is, is like, uh, is a must. Uh, same thing, but in a different way, which is figure out what is the cost of making mistakes. Uh, cost of making a mistake in a self-driving car means human lives are at stake. So it, it's, and cost of making a bad mistake in medicine uh, means you're freaking out someone who, whom you should not freak out. So that's very critical. Other thing to note is the latency of making decisions. So let's say in the case of fraud detection, uh, sometimes if you make a decision like in two seconds, you're already too late. So how do you make decisions in the five to 10 milliseconds that you have before you stop someone committing fraud? So, it's, so thinking about latency 
then gets to questions about where exactly do you deploy models, do you deploy models at source, or do you deploy models in the back end, um, et cetera, is something that uh, you will have to think about. Uh, the other aspect is cost of collection of uh, trained data. Um, trained data is very expensive. You need to determine how much are you ready to invest to actually collect that data. Uh, there is a, we will go over a section where there are different techniques of collecting data and they of course cost uh, differently. Uh, but cost is not just dollars and human price. Uh, cost also could be in terms of uh, policy and uh, how you communicate it to government agencies and your brand value and stuff like that. So you have to think about what is the cost of doing that collection. Yeah. Uh, before we move on, where do we just, where do we ask the question? Are we is this ethical? Like, are we, should we be looking at this data? Should we be solving for this? So we can ask. We can discuss it right now. Uh, he has the same question. Um, it is an important determination that every company will have to make. Uh, let me put it this way. Last year, I must have spent 25 to 30 percent of my time discussing with uh, our legal staff, policy people, communications people, because we just have to make sure that we are we are doing something which is not just legal, but something that you can defend to your customers. Customers, right? Um, at Capital One, there used to be this term called as the court of public opinion. So, what companies do need to be, you need to be in a position to defend it in the court of public opinion as well. So, I'm pretty sure a lot of these big companies do spend a lot of time thinking about what the policy should be. So, I, I mean, I cannot get too specific into like examples that I mean I have experience, but but I think it is very critically important because it is about. Uh, all of us, uh, I mean, our lives, not just our data right now, but in the future, our life, let's say, is going to be in the hands of machines, right? So, determining that policy is critical. Uh, as they say in self-driving, one of the one of the classic examples that people talk about is, if there is a car with like four people inside, but if it is about to hit, uh, or if there is a car with one person inside, about to hit like four people on the street, what is the policy? Does the software company make a policy that, hey, reduce the number of deaths, so in effect killing the rider or the passenger? I, I do not know, but these are important policy questions that companies will have to think about. I, I think it's probably fair to say that you know, the, the ethical question does come up in that identify the problem to be solved, because you're looking at the problem and you're, you have a sort of straw man of some form of solution, whether mm -hmm. it does or does not use machine learning. Yep. Agree. Yeah. So for for sure. Correct. So should you be solving this problem? It's an important question to ask. Yeah. Good. Good point. I will make sure I edit uh, my slides uh, accordingly. Um, moving on to the next uh, topic, which is gathering data and in particular uh, labeled uh, data. So everyone says data is the new oil, so kind of you should handle it with care. Uh, the, the, the question is how do you do that, right? So firstly, uh, again, what is valuable is labeled data, uh, data where you know whatever, you know your excess and your Y so that you can then use it for training. Uh, and the big question now is then how do you collect this data in a cheap format, in a legal format, uh, something where you can like defend, right? So there are multiple techniques. Uh, I am going to list out a few. So the first thing is leverage your products itself. So your products itself will have a lot of data that you generate. Uh, how do you leverage it correctly? Uh, you can instrument your own uh, products for immediate feedback. So which means, let's say, uh, add clicks, whether someone is clicking on, let's say, your uh, uh, app and actually installing something or finishing the tutorial, etc. So you, there are many places where you get your immediate feedback. So again, PM 101, you should be instrumenting your entire flow. There are instances where you do not get uh, data, uh, do, where you do not get feedback immediately. Again, credit card uh, or like fraud, credit card the default is an example. Uh, in such cases, you have to figure out what are the proxies that you will use uh, so that you kind of get that feedback sooner. So that's that's an example. Then there are other examples where it is going to be always impossible to figure out whether this, whether let's say fraud happened or not, right? So there will be instances where you will never get your true trained label data. Uh, so at that time, maybe you could use humans in the loop to kind of actually manually look at data and then say that yes, this looks like a fraudulent case. 
And then there is a fourth example where there are some companies who have done it really effectively, which is they use the set of labeled data to build models to kind of show an experience. Then they rely on the consumer feedback uh, to kind of build better experiences, right? Yeah. For example, what company comes to mind for that? Oh, last one, um, I mean, search, Google search, for example, right? Um, the, the more you search, the more they give you better results, the more you click on the better results, they keep getting better and better. Uh, step to account for? So, uh, absolutely. So, I'm not co covering too much of the engineering aspects in terms of just data cleanup, uh, removal of bias, uh, etc. Uh, ensuring that you have enough sample. But that certainly is an important aspect in, um, in, in this data preparation phase. Correct. Correct. Yes. Correct. Agreed. So, sorry. I think I understood. I misunderstood your. So, if you are talking about the same bias, you do need to be. You need. You do need to watch out for like self-fulfilling uh, cycles uh, in some form. Um, machine learning techniques, though, in some cases where you always keep a separate. Uh, validation data from, uh, let's say, your training data uh, is a way for you to kind of avoid that problem. Now, there is also this term called like generalization or over, over, so where if you if you build your model over repeatedly over the same set of data, then it is perfectly tuned for that set of data. But if you if you add another data in the mix, your model will fail to work. Uh, there is a lot of literature and safeguards to not 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 fall into that trap. So, for so another example is there is this technique called as dropouts, where when you train your model uh, for let's say for one iteration, you just drop out 50% of your data, for example. And in any case, most uh, machine learning people will always keep a 20% uh, data out. So, once your model is completely trained, you then you then validate it on that dot set of data. Awesome. So, uh, so the initial one was, the initial example was how do you capture label data or the feedback data from your own products? Uh, but there are other interesting ways for you to collect label data. So, the second technique is get your consumers to actually label data for you. A uh, couple of examples come to mind. The first example comes to mind is again, as I said, image uh, detection. Uh, each of these products, Google Photos, Facebook, Flickr, etc., have over the years asked you to tag yourself in, asked you to tag your whatever wife and your kids, etc. plus also type in the name. Uh, today, they're leveraging that data to actually search for you. Search when you just type in, let's say, your name or your wife's name or your kid's name, you will see a lot of data uh, or a lot of photos belonging to that particular person. So they kind of made us do the work for them to label the data that they use for training uh, and giving it back to us. Another example is location. So uh, Foursquare in the back in the day, or even Google Maps or Waze, uh, they are actively letting consumers kind of type in where they are ch with check-ins, et cetera. So you have a data for where you checked in, and then you have a lat long, and then you just use that to match uh, against each other. And with the many users doing it, you can then create a massive corpus of uh, label data. So that's a smart way of collecting data. Google Maps, for example, when I say that I'm going from point A to point B, uh, and I actually have my app open all throughout the way, then they know the destination that I plan to go, and they know the last GPS point around it. Um, so that is basically me labeling and telling them that, hey, that particular lat long is where is what 715 Jackson Street, where I, where I came in today. So that, that's an example of getting your consumers to work for you. Um, uh, I have heard about this, but not really, uh, I haven't seen any like written evidence, but uh, a lot of, so companies like Netflix and YouTube, they have a corpus of uh, video data uh, and audio as well with translations. So what they can or they do potentially do is what I've heard uh, is then do a speech or audio to text translation and not just in that language in multiple languages because they have, they have a corpus of training data uh, already. Uh, before I move forward, uh, I want to ask a question. Uh, I, on this slide, I have, a, I have one example of an 
incredibly smart idea to generate labeled data. Uh, before I press the next button, I, I just want to ask whether someone can guess what it is. Perfect, yeah. Uh, who was it? Good. Awesome. So uh, how many of you know what CAPTCHA is? OK, uh, almost everyone. Sounds good. So basically, this is CAPTCHA. The smartest thing about CAPTCHA is, uh, in, in this case, reCAPTCHA is owned by Google. The smartest thing about reCAPTCHA now is you, they are generating this labeled data not only from their own consumers, but from consumers on the on a different website altogether. So how does this work? So now if you go to, let's say, some random website, say suppose you want to buy tickets for the next uh, Giants game, uh, this, that's the first time you're visiting that website, um, they will check whether you are a human or not. So they will either show you something like this or something like, uh, something like that and ask you to type in what, this, uh, what these letters are. They will also probably ask you to identify, uh, is this a tree or is this a road sign? Uh, and stuff like that. Now they have uh, they have kind of done some partition on that data. So for example, I'm, I'm using an example here. Maybe in this case, Harold is something that they know is actually Harold. So they let humans actually type in Harold. But the next thing, they probably do not know with high confidence what that is. But if I start typing in A R A N R I B, then me as a consumer on a different website, I'm actually labeling data for eCAPTCHA. So that in my mind is I think the smartest idea ever generated for getting labeled data. Um, I, I mean, I, I typically always work in incognito windows. So whenever I go to any website, particularly e-commerce, something like this shows up, and I'm always helping label. Uh, I give label data back to back to Google. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Any any other question? Any other comments? This is a, this is a fascinating product example for me. So if, if anyone wants to add more insights, I mean, the idea of a caption is like prove that you're human, but you're training this model that will be able to do this without human interaction. So to me, it's just kind of interesting. Yep. Um, so I mean, is the original purpose of CAPTCHA still like there or? I, I do not know what the original purpose is. I presume original purpose is to actually detect whether you are a human or not. But then leveraging it in such a beautiful way, and then as as one example possibly could be that hey, you are the first word kind of checks whether you are a human or not. The second word actually lets you as a human being uh, label that particular image. That is fascinating. Yeah, but tra by training the machine learning algorithm, a machine can also do this. So it's not proving that you're a human. Is what I'm saying. That is correct. So. Yes, fair point. Um, I, I think that's why maybe they kind of got into a, a more complex capture there with images and stuff. Um, but, but you are right. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and now, if nothing works, there have been examples in uh, the part of a product uh, history where people have put in lots and lots of humans uh, into the loop to actually label data. Um, so some examples come to mind. Uh, the one of Google Books. So this is not about label data, but this is just about capturing data. So Marissa Mayer uh, and Larry Page, back in the day, early days of Google, uh, they had this idea of digitizing the entire library of books available online. Uh, so then they just got back to simple basics and said that, hey, if you just want to digitize one single book, let's figure out how much time it takes. So I think one of them was actually flipping the pages, other one was just taking pictures. And they did some simple calculation that they said, hey, if you automate this process, and if you have x number of human beings plus x number of machines doing this, we can actually digitize the entire set of world's books in whatever x number of uh, years. Uh, of course, only massive companies can do that kind of uh, data capturing. Uh, but maybe in your localized context, you could probably capture some data which is very localized to you, which has some whatever privacy barriers, et cetera. So just keep that in mind, too. Uh, if if you cannot think of any smart idea, maybe just putting humans into the loop can help you generate a lot of data. Another example is uh, Google Maps. Uh, so you can go online and read about their operations. Uh, they employ many, many human beings to actually look at images and actually kind of start labeling things. Uh, then you can use that evidence, again, to kind of train your machine learning algorithms to do that job. And then you can use the humans to just do validation. So you can play around with it, 
but having humans in the loop uh, can kickstart uh, a lot of your uh, yeah uh, a lot of your um, uh, labeled uh, data uh, processes uh, and this is half half joke uh, so I, I i know of a professor who said that hey uh, who else is cheap he said college grads so he's like i whenever i want to validate something and i want to get captured data i have many grads who i can throw in on the project and then they just get, go and get me a lot of data uh, and finish up their project so uh, so yes so you can you can figure out ways to get other people who can do it for free or for cheap uh, that brings to the question about again whose data is it anyway there are certainly other policies around how machine learning models should be used uh, but one thing which i want to cover is again data ownership uh, so we are in an interesting time there are important questions to be asked uh, gmail so certainly gmail's machines read my email uh, but do gmail users or do gmail employees read my email if machines read my email what what rights do machines have in terms of how how, how uh, i mean how pervasive it can be these are important questions to be answered uh, alexa amazon claims that alexa is only listening for the word alexa but yeah, where, do, where, where does that stop, right? Uh, do the, uh, can, is, that, is that a mic in my home which is constantly listening to me? I do not know. Uh, DNA sequencing and everything around medical data. Uh, who owns that data? If there is a big company which is like processing your DNA sequences, do they own the data? Do you own the data? Very important questions to be answered. Uh, face recognition. So Facebook probably knows about exactly how each, of, each one of us looks. Uh, and probably can do amazing predictions there. But say, suppose if I commit a crime tomorrow and Facebook is able to capture some video feed, uh, do they have the right to say that it was me who did committed that crime? I mean, right? So these are again important policy related questions that we need to answer. Uh, and then the last but not the least is uh, permissions. So uh, certainly a lot of these companies kind of throw in a lot of permissions in your whatever terms on services. Uh, but it's not just about get le getting the legal permission. It is also about ensuring that the consumers actually understand the permissions that they are signing up for. So thinking about all of these legal policy questions is, is critical, and the PM is going to be the person who is going to drive these discussions. So I may not like to answer this question, but when you're dealing with progressively improving uh, <coughs> models, you know, to what limit is there even with regulations and repercussions so i mean yes and no um, so europe is taking a very like stone well, whatever action on um, turn action or like is drawing a very strict line about like how do you own the data who who owns it whether you can make the decisions where you can employ them and stuff like that uh, and certainly big companies are clearly held accountable for the policies that they're building uh, but yes i mean data is going to be pervasive a lot of small companies will own the data I, I do not have a clear answer to how things are going to evolve yeah Correct. Yeah. So yes, the data retention is one. But what about trained models? If you have trained a model over based on data for last uh, 10, 10 years, uh, do you need to change your models if that data is? I mean, so very very important questions. And certainly there are many PMs along with of course legal policy people who are resolving this uh, as we speak. No, but uh, no. So I do not know the. I mean, the governments will have to figure out. Governments and regulators will have to figure out where to draw that line. Uh, but but so far I haven't heard anything where let's say you need to retrain your models because of old data. Yeah. So basically, plenty of questions uh, that that you as a pm will have to like really come to a resolution uh, with with the legal policy folks engineers etc open question here uh, again i mean one one important thing which 
people write about is big companies like big tech uh, is now is now a term many politicians are afraid of big tech because they own so much data uh, so the question is will data ownership be, will always be a purview of this massive companies or how is it going to shape with like smaller companies so i just wanted to take a pause here and throw the question back at you if some of you are startup founders or working in smaller companies how do you manage data if anyone wants to share um, that would be that would be great Mm -hmm. proprietary data sets are how companies are going to get competitive advantages. Mm -hmm. There's not really any advantage to them opening up any mm -hmm. more than there's an advantage for any of the proliferation of social networks that they were five years ago had an advantage in operating with each other. Yeah. So, I mean, examples which I have read about are legal stuff, right? So, I mean, if there is a company which is like doing operations on figuring out uh, what legal documents mean and then like coming up with uh, some tricks to kind of let's say fight that legal case all of that data is going to stay within that company so that is an, that is an example where a big company might not have ever have access to that data what if you want to operate in a country where they must have your data uh, uh, I, I know uh, I mean, I don't have an answer to that question, but it is it is an important thing which many companies are thinking about. There have been instances, of course, where large companies have pulled out uh, their entire business from China, in particular, uh, for the same reason, right? So, people, I mean, there is there is a lot of uh, articles around again, uh, not just I mean, individual individual privacy, individual content whether that data should sit in China, whether that data can actually leave the Chinese borders and or Russian borders and sit, uh, let's say, here in the US. If the data is here in the US, but for a Chinese or a Russian citizen, uh, who, 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 who has the right to subpoena that data? Is it only the US government or is it, like, these are all open questions that people are figuring out at this time. Yep. Mm -hmm. Working on right now and incorporating uh, big data from companies that are working with them because they're, they're government owned, mm -hmm. uh, or rather, that government has uh, ownership. Um, what again, I don't like any of repercussions, but, but what responses are there that companies can do beyond completely leaving the country uh, to be able to protect their data and not have it be incorporated into something that may not be? ethical within the confines of your country, but is a concern of what they want to go the direction in, in China, for example. Yeah. So, I mean, I think different companies have taken different stances. Google, certainly, there has been an instance where they pulled out. Uh, there are other companies uh, who complied and then who kind of put their data centers in China, who kind of, I mean, whenever Chinese government subpoenas or something, I, I don't even know whether subpoena <laughs> works, but whatever, or orders for any data, they just provide it. So different companies have taken different <coughs> approaches here. Um, so it remains an important question. Let me yeah. Sorry, so do you mind speaking up? We're creating too much data and we just weren't figuring out how to store it. Got it. So, can you speak to can, can you speak to precise examples of what sort of data and how did they generate yeah, it? Well, a, a very large, you know, content website. Uh, uh, so, that more than 10 million bits per day, and all the content you think create a record of data. <coughs> so, it's not just one article they're reading. It's all you know, the data from the browser and how much time they spend reading it and what part of mm -hmm. the article they stop by and. And even you're not even getting that data, and then you're like, well, that's a data point. Yep. So you start adding and adding more data points, and then at some point, you can say, you guys and she guys have data every day, and how you store it, and if you're not processing it every day, it's hard to reprocess it. Uh, and that, that problem happens every time. 
Yep. And that's a small company problem. Cool. Yep. So another small company problem um, along the same lines. We are, we it doesn't matter if we have all the data. We're strapped for resources, mm -hmm. and um, so we have commodified tools that plug into the systems we already use, mm -hmm. our CRM, etc. It doesn't matter if we have all the data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the other way to think about it is, I mean, machine learning certainly has a better output with a lot of data, uh, but certainly even with a small set of data, you can get something. You can at least validate some of your hypothesis, and then that can be a starting point, right? Uh, as long as you are validating and moving forward as a company, then getting more data to get to the next level of accuracy can kind of wait, maybe. Which acquisition? Okay. Nice. Yes. Sense. Sounds good. Yeah, so let's, uh, so great discussion. So I just, I wanted to learn as well, uh, and so I kind of stopped. Uh, we can probably move, move faster, but I also wanted to like maybe add a few uh, industries and to kind of uh, generate insights. If any one of you works in any of these industries, um, give us some insights. So insurance, medical, driving safety, smart homes, agriculture, very critical industries where uh, machine learning is about to revolutionize a lot of experience as well as the business. I have a question regarding your user score. Mm -hmm. Do you plan to collaborate with other companies to have like a unified ethical user score? I cannot, I, I'm not a product manager on this, I don't even know that answer, uh, but even if I knew I could not uh, respond. But I think you, uh, I think there is a blog on how user score is created. Um, you should check out whether, I will also check out later, but you can check out whether whether they have any future plans on how to improve, improve that or not. Uh, as far as my understanding is concerned, you're talking about Uber, right? Oh, oh sorry. So which user score were you talking about? Uh, yeah, I, I was talking about user score. Yeah. Yes, okay. But, but I don't work with it. Uh, yes, so if you're talking about Uber, Uber's uh, user score, uh, it is predominantly driven by the drivers. Uh, because it's a marketplace, riders rate drivers, drivers rate riders. So, so I... I do not know whether we have any plans to change it. So, so I was going to add an industry to that. Um, I'm in, I work in publishing, um, and we do a lot of direct sales at our company. So I think something like 40% of our books are PDFs. Mm -hmm. um, if we even had insight on how people were reading, that, would, that could completely revolutionize our editorial process. Mm -hmm. Because we, we also sell audio books, but we don't have any data or insights. Which yep. It's audible yep. and iBooks have more yep. people have them. So. Mm -hmm. good, good stuff. Sorry, I cannot hear you. The smartphones uh, uh -huh. we were mentioning, there's a lot of things going on with listening to electricity, harmonics, mm -hmm. what things are powered, and using energy. Interesting. We try to do analytics on energy usage. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yep. Absolutely. Yep.
So there are. So I have. Uh, I don't remember any consumer movement saying that hey, I, as a consumer, I own this my own my data. Um, but there are certainly a lot of regulators, or certainly a lot of like industry thinkers, who are pushing for that. Who are pushing for hey, who actually owns the data anyways, right? Uh, and again, Germany and Europe is a little ahead of the game uh, in terms of everyone in terms of who actually owns their consumer data. Sounds good. So moving over to the next, uh, yeah. So do you, uh, so you mentioned some of the industry there. So I work in healthcare mm -hmm. uh, as a PM, and there are a lot of different avenues that you can get data from. Mm -hmm. uh, you have uh, obviously the government, like CMS publishes, mm -hmm. like half the American population. They mm -hmm. have all the insurance claims and all the information that you can actually access. Obviously, you have to build in compliance mm -hmm. and sign up some paperwork, but you can access that. Then you also have uh, tons of like, for example, vaccination records <coughs> all over the place, mm -hmm. immunizations things. Uh, there are private HIEs being established now where you can have health information exchanges so you can actually have clinical data coming in. Nice, uh, so okay. There's a, there's a ton of data outside like the, uh, the private data mm -hmm. that exists within companies and obviously then you have the private data itself that you're getting from insurance companies or uh, you're getting from uh, the wearables that people are having that you can access. Interesting. So basically business development deals can get you that data which yeah. um, can, can get any small company that data as well. Right. So move, moving on to the next uh, stages, I've kind of combined the three stages, uh, but it is important for the PM to understand what your engineers do. So the first stage is preparation of data that includes stuff like let like me removing bias, uh, uh, any feature engineering that is required. Uh, that, that, that takes your engineers a lot of time. Once you do that, then there is certainly a, uh, certainly a step around figuring out what machine learning approach to use. Um, and even if you use that, training the model, figuring out uh, what the results are, uh, is a critical step. Uh, and then the third step after that is uh, the architecture and engineering around how do we scale it up, right? So there are questions about scaling it up uh, to let's say hundreds of millions of users and also making it run uh, real time. So a Python, so what you can run in a Python notebook and at high accuracy might not actually scale. So there is a lot of work that your engineering team has to do uh, in order to make uh, the product a reality. What do you as a product manager need to do uh, to kind of support them? So first is basically at least know what your team is talking about. Um, second thing is again, empathize the fact that they spend a lot of time, almost I think 70% of the time in the first step, data preparation uh, and feature engineering step. Uh, so please uh, recognize that fact. Certainly ask questions, but ask them in a respectful way because you, uh, machine learning experts kind of know what they're doing. Uh, but you should certainly feel free to ask questions to just make sure that you, it, it matches the product vision that you're trying to build. Uh, the fourth thing is, uh, Always encourage your team to start, start small uh, and then iterate on the way, which means if you do not really need 10 million uh, uh, data samples to actually, or if you do, really do not need to build your product for 10 million users, it's okay, try to build it on a small set, see whether it works, imp, uh, deploy it in real life, get feedback, and kind of iterate uh, in the process. Uh, do not boil the ocean. And then the last thing is uh, know when to stop. So uh, I've had experiences where we are trying to use machine learning to solve some problems. Um, but it just wasn't working because the data was so sparse or the events, so the label data or the propensity of it happening was so low that it never led to high precision, uh, no matter what we did. So trying to understand and then just stopping the team from burning further cycles uh, is going to be your job because you have to be the person kind of to bring in the bad news. Now to the next step. So once, let's say, all your decisions are made, uh, how do you build a user experience around it, right? So let's take uh, let's take again a few examples of what typically can happen. Uh, let me first talk about what precision is and what recall is. Uh, precision, by definition, is let's say if you say that hey, these ten uh, these ten consumer whatever these ten data samples are blue, for example. Right? Let me make it simple. Uh, but if out of those ten, only eight of them are actually blue, then your precision is uh, eighty percent. A recall is how many of your samples are you actually covering? Now, if your data has, let's say, 14 
or uh, let us say 20 blues and if you are able to detect only 12, so which means that your recall is 60 percent. So with that in mind, uh, when you start, when you start building any machine learning product or uh, building or deploying any machine learning algo, you hope that your curve looks like this, where uh, you are able to get high precision as well as high recall. But frequently, at least in the first couple of tries, that is not what will happen. You will either have something like this, where you are able to get high precision but with very low recall, or you are able to collect, all, you are able to filter out the right set of sample in this, uh, in, in your set, but your accuracy is very low. You are not actually, uh, and there are a lot of false positives in, in the mix. So the question is, what will you do uh, in the process? You just then have to figure out whether you can build different consumer experiences to kind of tackle problems at both, at, at, at both ends. So let me give you some, some examples. Um, if, let's say, your precision is high, which means that whenever you say that, hey, this is true, it is true with high pre pre probability, uh, say with something like marketing, then what you can do is you can start small. You, you know that your precision is high, so you go down that road and kind of build products around that, very well knowing that you probably are not reaching uh, all of the people whom you uh, need to reach. On the other hand, you could also go the other way around, where you could collect a lot of sample, or you could collect a lot of data, you could filter a lot of data. You know most of the people you're interested in are in that set, uh, so you then maybe deploy humans to then uh, kind of actually pick the people that you are interested in or the events that you are interested in. Does this make sense or? It doesn't make sense to me, but. <laughs> uh, 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 let, me, let me give you some more examples, right? Uh, so for, let's take, let's take that into account. Now, if I want to find out uh, all the stop signs in, let's say, this particular, whatever, 10 segments of the street. Uh, I could do two things. I could have a model that is high recall but low precision, which would mean that it could give me a lot of pictures of anything that is remotely red in color, uh, but it is not a stop sign. Now what I can do is I can have like maybe 1,000 of those images and send it to operators, and then the operators look at these 1,000 images and then say that, yeah, these 800 or these, let's say, 300, are actually stop signs. What that does is it still filters out and from your millions of images, you're still getting down to a thousand where your, which contains, let's say, 90% of your um, uh, stop signs. But now you just have to put humans in the mix because not all of the thousand are actually stop signs. So that is one such example. The other example on this side if, is if you're predicting things correctly, uh, then if you say that, hey, let's say there are hundreds, there are, let's say, 600 customers whom you need to reach out, but you don't want to be in a position where you're reaching out random customer who is not in a position to be helped, but for some reason, you're able to detect, filter out, let's say, 100 of those examples, 80 of which are actually customers in need. So you say, okay, I cannot reach out to 600 people, but at least of this 100, I'm going to call all of this 100, 20 people will say that, no, 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 you got the wrong person, but 80 of those people are actually people you need to reach, right? So it's like starting small uh, with high accuracy and then getting data from that, that can help you improve your model further. That's basically it is. There are, uh, let me now try to rush because it's already eight. Uh, there are other things that you need to uh, think about. Uh, once you build a model, the first thing that you need to ask is, hey, uh, um, I mean, this is what my model does, but how important is the effect that, or how, imp how, how impactful is what the model does to the larger scheme of things in terms of larger consumer experience uh, or the business? Uh, there are instances where what you build uh, or the experience that you improve actually cannibalizes some other metric. Let me give an example. Uh, if you, let's say Groupon, for example, there was one instance where we improved the CTR on a particular type of deals, but what happened is people were just opening up those deals, but not making a purchase. So your CTR went up, but your conversion rent, ra rate fell down. Effectively, the net net, uh, it, it really didn't make any impact, right? So understanding what exactly hap ha is happening uh, is very important. Um, and then the third thing is very frequently you will be in a position where you have to make some trade-offs. Sometimes a particular feature helps you get more growth, 
um, high engagement but low re revenue. Some other things get you high engagement, high revenue but low growth. You need to, as a company, decide what is your top metric and then prioritize accordingly. Naturally, different companies at different uh, life stages have different uh, top uh, priorities. Why is that a decision that you're making at the end of the workflow as opposed to at the beginning? No, not necessarily. It is something that uh, you need to decide as a product team well, well in advance. Um, but at this point, uh, that is where a decision comes into play. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. this, this large area around gathering labeling data, prepping, machine models, uh, machine learning models, etc. Mm -hmm. very engineering driven. Correct. I would also imagine they take up a very large part of the actual development life cycle as well. Correct. So, you know, sort of like so I mean, uh, yes and no. I mean, sometimes data collection can take a long time. Um, because if, if data collection, let's say, out in the real world, it takes a long time, right? So, yes and no. Maybe in terms of uh, calendar days, this, this particular phase can take a long, long, long time. In terms of maybe, let's say, the actual human hours spent coding or something, certainly what the engineers do take consume a lot, consumes a lot of time. Yeah, so I, I guess what, where, where I was getting to is sort of like in that middle part of the development process, mm -hmm. um, what are you finding yourself as a product manager doing on a day-to-day -day basis? So most PMs, are, I mean, there are always multiple projects in the mix. Um, also, that step is iterative, right? So even if, let's say, you have a long-term vision, at any given time, you can say that, hey, let me start collecting small set of data. So this entire phase, it need not be a six-month thing. It can be smaller. It can be, it can be this entire sequence of events, but done like six times in six months. So typically, don't find yourself out of work uh, because there are multiple projects to do. There are multiple times you need to do this. You, you had a question? To some, to some, you're getting small and smaller intervals, but it's still a waterfall process, it appears. Um, are there ways where you can be able to act in an agile fashion when you're dealing with machine learning as a necessary component for your product? Uh, good question. So certainly the way I have presented it, it looks like a waterfall. Um, but there, are, there, is, there is a lot of iteration that happens all throughout, right? Uh, you, again, how fast you iterate depends on how, make, how smaller you make the steps, but how frequently you uh, deploy them. Uh, it again de de depends on which company you work for, maybe large companies. Actually figuring this out and figuring out to uh, integrate like legal policy issues can take a long time, right? And if you do not have a clear answer there, then there is no point in building uh, or like spending your engineering team resources. So it is a mix. Uh, you, need to, you need to play by the year. Then I think this is one of the last slides, which is the last thing is, if you have a decision, you also need to figure out a way to uh, inform the consumer on why this decision is made. So why wasn't my credit card approved? Uh, let's say, why can I not log in? Because maybe you detect me as a spam or a, or a bot, but I'm not. Uh, or in some critical cases, if my earnings are blocked, uh, then that is something that you really have to explain it to the consumer. So bear that in mind always. Uh, if your machine learning model or product is in the experimentation phase, uh, explain it elaborately to the consumer. Call it out as a beta, right? So no, none of us complain when, let's say, Google or Facebook photos or Google photos got our initial tagging wrong, uh, because we all kind of knew that it is an experimental stuff. Uh, Alexa does a lot of funny things sometimes. None of us complain, right? Uh, having said that, the first time, let's say, a self-driving car actually is responsible for an accident, people are going to freak out. So it's a question of consumer expectations. Sometimes you have to set them. Sometimes you're not in a position to set them correctly. And then the last point, uh, if you're not at a point where you can actually explain to the consumer what, what, is, what is going on, or, or explain to the consumer the way you have arrived at a decision, and if it is critical, maybe it is time not to launch a product. So you should always keep that in mind. Uh, Moving on to the last section, interview tips. So, I mean, if any one of you is looking forward to interview as a PM on machine learning products, certainly everything around PM 101 kind of uh, is, is, is something that you have to do. Uh, 
besides that, make sure that you know your basic statistics. Sometimes basic stats questions are asked and people kind of fumble, not because they do not know, but it's just been like 10 years when they did uh, stats last. Uh, third thing is get your hands dirty. So there are plenty of courses available on Coursera, Udacity, etc., where you will be able to actually build your DNNs or you will be able to train data, build data, see how it looks. And literally these, uh, these, course, these kind of Udacity Coursera have, have created a lot of sandboxes where you can play. Anybody who hasn't had too much experience can also go and play. So, so do it. Uh, you should do it as a PM. And then last but not the least, hopefully the framework that uh, I have put together uh, or, and you can of course modify it yourself, but hopefully a framework like this will help you think through the, any problem uh, case study or a product design case study uh, that, that is asked of you uh, in an interview. Uh, so that's all, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I had a lot of fun being here. Yep. So do you think it's overly ambitious or confident that a product manager who would do, you know, start to get their hands dirty mm -hmm. in relationship to, let's say, a job hiring situation from a, a data engineer who's trying to get into product, mm -hmm. they're obviously going to have that technical acumen. Correct, correct. It's just going to blow that other person out of the water. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take a while before that you can be equitable in terms of being considered for that role. For the product role. So I would say, I mean, based off what we interview, based off what I've heard, uh, I think about 20% of it is technical, like, right? So most of it is still like regular, right. regular PM 101 yeah. is what I would say. Uh, but at, yes, so people do get technical, people do ask questions about stats. And if you just know, if you have built, done things yourself, yeah. it just gives you an edge in an interview. So how does something like a generative adversarial network fit in that model that you showed us? Is it like filtering data or gathering data, or is it more of a selecting the ML? So I have never been in situations where we have used that, uh, but they are going to be critical for, let's say, self-driving, uh, right? Um, most of that, most, most, of, most of the data generated for, for that, those purposes, are actually done in-house in, let's say, uh, one of these test tracks. So people do not typically seek for the data, or I, I do not know the answer to the question, but I know for sure that people, companies must be actually training. So you should, you should read uh, this. So there is an Atlantic article about how Waymo does its stuff. Uh, it's a public article. They kind of explain how exactly they, they create those uh, labeled data like events. So it is, again, as I said, more or less it is the same, right? Figuring out what problem to solve, whether it is important or not, whether you can measure it. All of it is regular PM 101. For machine learned products in particular, there are these, the things that I spoke to, are something that you also need to keep in mind. Because um, how you solve the problem in this case becomes important, right? Let's say building a website, the how part isn't that critical as of today, because many people have done it in the past. That, that, that's basically the, the difference. <laughs> so, so someone, someone asked about bias in the past, and I think you an answered it from a system, um, statistical bias mm -hmm. perspective, but especially because you use a lot of like loan data. Mm -hmm. um, how do we, as product managers, make sure we're just not out there like perpetrating racist data and just mm -hmm. really shady data that's based in um, just yeah, yeah, correct. So uh, certainly a very critical problem that Facebook is looking to solve, right? Uh, if you look at uh, the stuff that, let's say, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Chris Cox and all of their leaders have put together, looks like that is one of the top problems for this year. Uh, because yes, we can certainly get into this scenario where maybe some racist comment can get likes uh, and like, act, uh, like positive reinforcement where it should not. So how to figure that out? It's, it's a critical question. So a way to do it is maybe employ humans in the process where at least some part of the decision-making process is reviewed by humans 
and if humans at that point, the moderators say that, hey, something is wrong here, then that gets corrected back into your training uh, models. So I cannot think of any other way of doing it besides employing humans and moderators, at least at the moment. 